Well, good morning. It is so glad to see you all here today. I want to invite you to stand and sing with us. Come on.
Let's go ahead and have a seat. Uh, one of our friends, he's a pastor down in Tampa. Well, actually, we're, first off, we're starting a new series this weekend called Won't You Be My Neighbor? And uh, we have a friend down in Tampa. He's a pastor. He wrote a spoken word piece about it. We'd like to share that with you guys. Let's go ahead and watch. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Will you be my neighbor? But wait. There's some conditions. You have to line up with my neighbor rendition. See, you have to line up with my position on the border wall, immigration and prison reform. See, neighbor, you don't have to look like me, but you have to conform and assimilate to what I think is the norm. And if not, I'll unfriend you. I'll block you. I'll drop you. Behind your back, you can be sure that I'll mock you. And if you do line up with my ideas, well, great. But wait, I need to check your papers, your credit score, and by the way, are you straight? Because honestly, I hate people that are different than me. I don't even talk to half the people in my family tree because they don't know how to be a good neighbor like me. there's still a lot of people that flow like that. They say they want to be your neighbor, but only if you think like them, vote like them, if you're unwoke like them. But the reality is, we're all under construction. We need God's help to build with our neighbors. 
basket. But what did Jesus really mean when he said we must love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Well, most people don't really know because their Bible's collecting dust up on the shelf. Well, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus answers the question. He was asked, who is my neighbor? There's a powerful lesson. His culture, like ours, was full of discrimination. People also decided who was their neighbor by process of elimination. So he told this parable of this Samaritan that was despised and how two religious leaders walked by and basically compromised. He revised this Samaritan's title to good because he stopped and helped this beat up Jew like a true neighbor would. Even though their people had beef and if that Jew wasn't hurt, he might have actually given that Samaritan grief. So we can learn that no matter their lifestyle, politics, or skin color, we can show our neighbor the love of Christ as a sister or a brother. Let's love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So first off, who is excited to be at church today? I sure hope that you were able to get here a little bit easier this week. <laughs> We know that last week was a bit of a challenge, but first off, my name is Thomas, and I'm the campus pastor for our Ocala campus. And I want to give a big shout out to our frontliners here at the Springs, all of our volunteers. It's incredible. As you guys know, as a church, we have pivoted time and time again, and the volunteers that we have at our church, oh my goodness, they are truly spectacular how they have sacrificially served and created an environment for all of us to be able to worship, to come to celebrate and grow in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And for us, it's just knowing that the Springs isn't just a screen that we watch or a building that we come to or even a drive-in that we drive into, but a family that we're a part of. And that's a big reason why we have this blue card right here that we call the Connect card. And also we have it digitally as we've gone digital in this digital season where you can go to the springs.net forward slash connect card. And all I want you guys to do is take a moment to go there. We ask everyone to go there each week just to connect with us. And if you have a prayer request, go ahead and jot that down because we have an entire team that prays over those every week. And what we'll do is we'll reach out to you and just welcome you and thank you for being here today as well. And I'm so pumped. As you guys know, we're starting a brand new series that called Won't You Be My Neighbor? Of looking into God's word and what it looks like to truly love our neighbor as also as we love God. So I want you guys to give it up big for Pastor Brian as he comes out. As we begin this series, won't you be my neighbor? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you be my neighbor well, what's up church at the springs how's everybody today all right hey i want to welcome everybody here in ocala and everybody joining us on the other side of the camera online and for the very first week back in the buildings would you welcome our campuses village and southwest as well that's pretty awesome welcome to all of you it's an exciting weekend, man. It's so good to be back. Listen, my name is Brian. I'm one of the teaching pastors on the team. And uh, it feels so good to be back in the room with you guys. <clears throat> well, as Thomas said a moment ago, 
Today we're launching a new series that very well may take us through the duration of the summer, and that's Won't You Be My Neighbor. Now, any of you who are over the age of, say, 20 or 25 know that this series is based on a popular television show called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, my son, who's 10, I asked him the other day if he knew who Mr. Rogers was, Fred Rogers. And he goes, yeah, he's that baseball player, right? I was like, maybe, I don't think so. Um, but anyway, if you don't know, uh, if you're young, you don't know what Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was. It was a, uh, to, to call it popular would be an understatement, right? Like th this show was iconic. Um, it's the longest running children's show of all time. Anywhere in the world. 33 seasons in all. And what really made Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood stand apart from all of the other TV shows that uh, are, are oriented toward a childhood demographic is the fact that where other shows went after a, ch a child's mind, this show really targeted their hearts. It really wanted children to understand the fact that they are loved, valued, and appreciated for exactly who they are. Uh, and that they have ultimately inherent value that they received from God the day that they were born. And so um, I just think Mr. Rogers is incredible. And so um, one of the things that he was known for and is still known for is really being America's favorite neighbor. Right? Like everyone wanted to be Mr. Rogers' neighbor. And so it's no surprise that uh, last year uh, a movie came out uh, by the name of A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And uh, they wanted to make this movie based on the life of Fred Rogers, right? And movie producers in Hollywood had this dilemma. They, they, they had to decide who was going to play the role of Fred Rogers. I mean, this is no easy task, right? Like, who is going to be the actor depicting Mr. Rogers? And so after a lot of discussion and deliberation, they decided that none other than Tom Hanks should play the role of Mr. Rogers. I mean, th th I just think this is a great decision. Um, I, I personally believe Tom Hanks is one of the greatest actors of our time. Uh, I honestly think he's one of the greatest actors of all time. You may disagree. That's fine. You're entitled to your wrong opinion. Um, <laughs> But, but I think Tom Hanks is amazing. I think he was the perfect person to portray uh, Mr. Rogers. And frankly, he did a great job doing so. Um, but what's interesting about this is that when CBS Morning News interviewed Tom Hanks about his role playing Mr. Rogers, um, they asked him how he felt about it. And he said, I was terrified. Well, this was obviously surprising to the interviewers from CBS Morning News. And so they said, what was so terrifying about it? And he said, well, it all began when we were filming on the set in uh, Mr. Rogers' hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I walked off the production set one day, and one of the people who lives in that neighborhood saw me from across this gate or this fence, and he shouted to me, uh, Mr. Hanks! Yeah, uh, I just want you to know that we here in Pittsburgh take Mr. Rogers very seriously. So don't screw this up. <laughs> that was the moment when Tom Hanks was kind of like, what did I get myself into with this role, right? But he said the most intimidating thing wasn't the way that people respected Mr. Rogers. It was the fact that, that Fred Rogers just emanated this Christ-like love that's, that's ultimately hard to imitate. It's, it's difficult to emulate. And he said, the hardest thing for me about playing that role was figuring out how do I become America's favorite neighbor? How do I even really become a good neighbor? And I just wonder how many of us in this room are intimidated by that role too. Like, we know that the Bible says to love God and love our neighbor. Ron talked last week about how those are no, not two separate things, but really one and the same. We don't love God and love our neighbor. We love God by loving our neighbor. To say that we love God but not love our neighbor is impossible. God says, if you love me, you will ultimately love your neighbor. You will love your black neighbor and your white neighbor. You will love your Republican neighbor and your Democrat number, neighbor, your, your gay neighbor and your straight neighbor. Hello. There's, there's no loophole. There's, there's no exception in this. We, we love God by loving our neighbor. <laughs> And, and I think that that sounds real pretty. <laughs> but can we just admit the fact that sometimes that's really hard to do? And, and if I can just be honest, in, in the same way that I think Tom Hanks was intimidated by the role of being a good neighbor, I, I'm often intimidated by that too. Th there was one guiding principle that Mr. Rogers lived by, and that's simply this. What it, what it looks like to be a good neighbor is to be a good neighbor. What it, what it looks like rather to love your neighbor is to be 
a good neighbor? What if the best way to love your neighbor is to simply be a good neighbor? Today, what I want to do is take you back into the same text we looked at last week, kind of the, the later half of it. And I want to give you three ways to be a good neighbor. As we launch into this summer series, I want to give you some really practical, user-friendly stuff today. I hope that you'll follow along on the YouVersion notes on the YouVersion Bible app and, and maybe perhaps take some notes of your own. Because again, I don't want to just give you some overarching principles or some, some information that might sound good or feel good. I want to give you some really practical, uh, uh, applicable stuff that, that perhaps has the power to transform your relationships within your immediate community. So um, let's pray together and then we'll jump into the text. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. Uh, we really believe it to be more than words on a page or pages in a book. We believe it to be the almighty God-breathed, Holy Spirit-inspired word of God. Amen, somebody? Like, do we believe this book has power? And so, God, we just ask that you take this book and do something that only you can do. Please, in the name of Jesus, bring back professional sports so that we have something to watch on TV. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you ready to go? All right, I said, are you ready to go? Come on, somebody. This is the nine o'clock service. I remember this being the party service, okay? So don't let me down. Don't disappoint me today. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Last week, we started looking at this story where Jesus was approached by this young Jewish expert. And this religious expert comes to him and, and asks a question that was frequently asked of Jewish rabbis back then. He said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds in the way that Jesus often responded. He responded to a question with a question, right. He says, well, uh, tell me about the, uh, the law of Moses. How do you read it? And the man said, well, it basically boils down to love God and love your neighbor. And Jesus says, great answer. Um, but old boy pushed his luck. He says, well, who exactly is my neighbor? And rather than just giving him a straight answer, Jesus tells a story. And this is where we'll pick it up in Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. The Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, where he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. And by chance, a priest came along. Oh, well, that's good. That's good because, like, you know, a priest is someone who ultimately is trained to help people. But it says when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Well, then a temple assistant walked over. Uh, in your translation, it might say a Levite. A Levite was simply a temple assistant and looked at him lying there. What does he do? By, but he also passed by on the other side. Then, uh, now, now this is the point, by the way, where a Jewish audience would have seen the trajectory of this story and thought to themselves, okay, I, I know where this is going. I, I know who's next. First, we had the, the priest who's sort of like the, the temple elite. And, and then we have his assistant, the Levite. So the, the next person in line there in the pecking order should be a Jewish layman, right? a, a congregation member, a volunteer of sorts. But Jesus jukes him. Look what he does. He says, then a despised, what's the next word say? Samaritan. Now, you may have heard of this story or heard the phrase Good Samaritan, right? When someone does a good deed, we often use the, the phrase Good Samaritan to describe them. But in the ancient Jewish mind, Samaritans were anything but good. In fact, Samaritans were rotten. Samaritans were evil. Samaritans were godless, pagan worshiping nobodies. And in the midst of that racial tension, Jesus decides to use a despised Samaritan as the good guy in the story? What? You're going to make a Samaritan the hero, Jesus? Really, you could have chosen anybody, but you choose a Samaritan. It says when the Samaritan came along, when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds. But he didn't just stop there. See, using olive oil and wine, bandaged them. And, and then he put the man on his own donkey, not just any old donkey, on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. And if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, now look at what Jesus says to this Jewish religious expert who asked him this question in the first place. He says, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? 
Thinking back on the story, which one's the most neighborly? The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. And the same command that Jesus ends this story with is the same command he gives us today. Now go and do the same. And and the best way to love your neighbor is by being a good neighbor in the first place. How do we do this? Jesus gives us three clues in the story. The first is this. I hope you'll write it down. First is this. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. It's interesting to me that all three of the men in the story saw the half-dead, wounded man on the side of the road. But where two men saw an interruption, one man saw an invitation. I wonder when you see your neighbors, what do you see? Because I believe that what you see determines how you feel. The Bible says that when the Samaritan man saw the half-dead man on the side of the road, he saw him, and when he saw him, this compassion was awakened within him. What you see determines how you feel. That's true. I think if you see disappointment, you're going to feel discouraged. If you, feel, if you see inconvenience, you're ultimately going to feel annoyed. If you see rejection, you're going to feel failure. But on the other hand, if you see opportunity, you're going to feel courage. If you see progress, you're going to feel victory. If you see a gift, you're going to see gratitude. You see, what you see determines what you feel. And what you feel determines how you respond. The Bible says in this passage that the Samaritan man saw the half-dead man, felt compassion, and responded by showing mercy. When you see your neighbors, what do you see? What do you feel? How do you respond? I, I, I hate to admit it, but there are some times when I see my neighbors and I'm just in a hurry. I've got things going on or I kind of assume certain things about them. And so I do what the priest and the Levite did. I, I, I pass by on the other side of the road. Some of you do this at Publix. You see somebody from the community and you're thinking, oh man, I don't know if I have time for this. I don't know. So you pass by on the other side, which by the way, Publix has made a lot easier easier for us with the arrows in the aisle that I, for one, ignore half the time. You're judging me silently. I can feel it. Uh, but, but, I, but I think sometimes if we're honest, we do exactly what the priest and the Levite did rather than what the Samaritan did. We, we, we pass by on the other side of the road. Be, be because I, I think that we don't see the way that God sees. We don't see them through the eyes of, of the Lord. Admittedly, this is hard, isn't it? This is not something uh, that comes naturally. Uh, Fred Rogers himself admitted the fact that if it weren't for his personal relationship with Jesus, that he would have had a hard time seeing people's worth. It's interesting that when he was a kid, Fred Rogers talks about how um, when, when, when he was a child, his mom trained him to see people differently. Right? So when he would stare at a kid that was deformed or had some sort of disorder, rather than his mom saying, oh, quit staring, look, look away, she would train him to see that person differently. And so he grew up seeing the inherent image of God, the, the value that people had deep inside. And so at one point when network executives were, were pressuring him to bring more celebrity guests on the show, Mr. Rogers said, no, I I don't want to do that. I want to have people on my show who are are ordinary or or even people who are overlooked, people who are considered to be the least of society that that often are judged or misjudged in a number of different ways. And so he would bring people on his show that he believed the world needed to see and, and learn to appreciate. On other situations, he'd be watching TV and he would see uh, terrorism or calamity of, in a number of different ways. And, and when he'd see that, his mom would say, don't look away, look for the helpers. Look for the helpers among those who hurt. And he said, I grew up wanting to be one of those helpers and wanted to, wanting to feature those kinds of helpers on my show. See, what his mom was teaching him was to open his eyes because how you see determines how you feel and how you feel determines how you respond. Open your eyes. The second tip that this script, the scripture we looked at a moment ago gives us is this. Make some room. 
I like this one. Make some room. The Samaritan man in this passage sees the half-dead man on the side of the road, and he makes some room. He makes some room in his schedule. He makes some room in his resources. He makes some room in his finances to help the man because compassion was welling up within him. Now I have to wonder, look up here for a moment. I have to wonder, why didn't the priest and the temple assistant help the half-dead man? I don't think it's because they were bad. I think it's because they were busy. I mean, the reason why they didn't help their neighbors is the same reason that we often don't help ours. We don't get to know them, not because we're bad people, but just because we're busy. We don't have a lot of room or we don't have a lot of margin. And how many of you know that when you don't have margin in your time, your resources, or your finances, everything feels like an interruption? But it's interesting that this, this, this Samaritan man, he didn't see it as an interruption. He saw it as an invitation. Why? Because he decided to make some room. I think that like this is one of the biggest things that God calls us to as Christians. And, and one of the things that's so easy for us to get wrong a lot of the time because we've just got so much going on and, and, and we're so laser focused on the things that we have in our, in our schedule and, and we're so laser focused on the things that we have to spend our resources and money on that we, we often miss opportunities that God is putting before us. I found this great quote a couple years ago from Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I love. He said it this way. He said, we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions. Now, how are you going to be ready to let God interrupt across your path with these people, these neighbors, if, if you're not willing to make some room? This is something we'll be talking about throughout the course of this series. There's this great story that I came across in my research this week. Uh, about a college kid named, uh, see if I can pronounce this and hopefully I don't botch it, uh, Anthony Bresnikin. Uh, Anthony Bresnikin is now a, a writer for Entertainment Weekly. And he recalls this time when he was in college a couple decades ago when um, at one point his grandfather had passed away. And it happened to be during kind of one of the first weeks when he was getting adjusted in school. And, and he didn't really have a support system. He didn't really have anyone to call friends or neighbors. And so for him, he, he, it was just a very lonely time. In fact, he tweeted about it recently saying this, I was struggling lonely, dealing with a lot of broken pieces and not adjusting well. And at one point he's walking through his, the commons at his college and, and he had recently seen a rerun of a Mr. Rogers episode talking about how, uh, you know, children are loved and valued and all of this. And and then at one point, he goes to the elevator. The elevator opens, and Fred Rogers is standing there in the elevator at his school. And he just has this, like, awestruck moment. Like, what? I, I, I just saw you on TV. Like, what are you doing in the elevator at my college? This is crazy. And I love what, what Fred Rogers says to him. He says, were you one of my neighbors? <laughs> and Anthony says, if you mean one of your viewers, then yes. And Mr. Rogers says, well, tell me about yourself. And, and Anthony said, unexpectedly, he began to just kind of well up with emotion. And he started to tell Mr. Rogers about how it had been a really difficult week for him. And Fred said, well, if you have a moment, I'd love to hear more. And so Fred Rogers literally just in the commons of their college found this cozy little corner. They sit down and for more than an hour... Fred Rogers listens to this young man, freshman in college, pour out his heart about his grandpa that had recently deceased and a number of other hardships that he'd gone through. And, and, and Fred takes the time to listen, pray for him, minister to him, and then hug him before walking away. And, and before he walks away, Anthony Bresnikin says to him, listen, Mr. Rogers, <laughs> this, is a, this is not how I saw today going. Like, this is amazing. I, I never thought I would run into you. I never thought that you would sit for over an hour, listen, pray, minister to me. Like, this is crazy. Um, and, and I love how Fred Rogers responds. He says, Anthony, I want you to know sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time. And I've always got time for my neighbors. 
Can I ask you this today? Do you have time for your neighbors? Have you made enough room that if God brings someone across your path who needs ministering to, you can take the proper time to listen, to pray, to minister to them? If not, Maybe like the Samaritan man in this passage, it's time to make some room. Finally, here's the third tip that this scripture gives us today. Third way to be a good neighbor, and this is so, uh, so pertinent to today's society, break through barriers. Break through barriers. At the end of this story, Jesus turns back to this Jewish religious scholar and says, okay, now thinking back on the story I just told you, um, which of these men would you say is a good neighbor? Which one is the most neighborly? And the Jewish expert says, um, the one that showed mercy. Now, the easy way to answer this question would have been saying the Samaritan man, right? But watch this now. Racial tensions ran so deep back then that this Jewish scholar couldn't even bring himself to speak the word Samaritan. Like this was the original S word back then, right? Like Samaritan was a four-letter word in this society. Couldn't even say it. I, I just think it's funny when people think that, that, that racism is something that's like a, a 21st or 20th century issue, that, that within the last 100, 150 years it sort of was conceived. No! This goes back thousands of years. It was as bad or worse during Jesus' day. And now don't miss this, give me your eyes. How amazing is it that our Jesus could have chosen any hero for this story but he decides to make this Jewish scholar face some of the deep racial prejudices that were rooted within him. When originally he probably thought he was pretty good at loving God by loving his neighbor, but Jesus wanted him to see that maybe there's one neighbor in particular that you still struggle with. But if you would open your eyes, see him as God sees him, if you would make some room in your hearts, in your time, in your resources, in your finances, then, then maybe you'd be able to break through some barriers. Who, who, who was the good neighbor in this story? Was it not the Samaritan man who showed mercy? And is it not mercy that's required to break through barriers? Are you tracking? And th this is exactly the kind of stuff that Mr. Rogers constantly wanted to confront on his show. It's crazy to me how savage Mr. Rogers was because he was a television show icon. Like he hosted a kid's show, but he constantly wanted to confront stuff like racism. And there's one particular figure that was on his show regularly whom he used very purposefully in order to do this. And rather than me telling you about it, I want to show you. Take a look. Isn't that cool? Wow, way to break through some barriers. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend pulling out a kiddie pool, sticking your feet in it, and inviting your neighbors, hey, Jim, when you're done with the lawn, come on over. Like, might become the neighborhood creeper. But like, but I just wonder if there are some creative ways that you could break through some barriers. Because the best way to love your neighbor is to be a good neighbor. Oh, that God might open our eyes, help us make some room and break through barriers. I think this summer is going to be cool. I really do. Um, in the next couple weeks, we're going to start giving you guys some more resources that will help you um, really personally figure out how to love your neighbors and, and have a presence in your neighborhood. And, and I'm excited about what God's going to do there. Um, but in closing, I just want to take us back really quickly to the story that we looked at a moment ago. Um, because as I was reading through it this week, I kind of sense the Holy Spirit asking me, Brian, who are you in the story? Who are you in the story? Are you the religious scholar who thinks he loves his neighbors well, but maybe needs to be challenged about some of his inner prejudice? Uh, may, maybe perhaps it's the priest or the temple worker who felt like they didn't have enough time or maybe weren't qualified, and so they passed by on the other side of the road. Or maybe, maybe you're the half-dead person on the side of the road. And I, I just want to pose the same question to you today. Who are you in this story? 
And, and that being the case, how might you respond to the word that God has given us this morning? At one point or another, every one of us has been the half dead, haven't we? And if that's you today, if, if you identify with this half dead Jewish man who's been beaten down, lying on the side of the road, can I just tell you this morning that Jesus is the rescuer you've been waiting for? That, that's what somebody needs to hear today. God brought you to church to get the rescue that can only be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I want you to know that the reason Christ came into this world was not to start some religion. It wasn't so that we could establish this institution called the church. It had nothing to do with any of that. I mean, all that's well and good, but, but he did that that you might have a relationship with him. The God of the universe loves you way too much to let you go into eternity without him. And so he sent a solution, and his name is Jesus. And if today you've never given your life to the Lord, you've never committed your life to him, you've never um, admitted that you're a sinner and received forgiveness for that, if you've never stepped into that relationship with God that can begin today and last forever, can I just implore you to make that decision today? If you're ready to make that choice, let's pray together. At every campus, would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's go before God right now. If you're ready to make that choice, if you're ready to call Jesus Christ Lord and call yourself a follower of his, would you just pray this with me? Say, God, thank you for sending Jesus. I recognize today that I've been doing my life my way, and it doesn't work. I feel half dead and broken, and I need you to forgive me, bring me back to life, and set me free. And from this day forward, I want to be a follower of Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Go ahead and look up here. Look, if you prayed that prayer today, I want to congratulate you. In fact, can we clap our hands and just congratulate everyone who prayed that prayer today? Hallelujah. Yeah. That's awesome. I really believe that to be the single most important, most valuable decision that you will ever make in your life. Um, God, God is right now beginning a work in your heart of transforming your life in a way that you could never do on your own. It won't happen overnight, but over time you'll begin to notice God doing things that are only attributed to Him. And so I'm so excited about that decision you made today. And if you made that decision, I want to encourage you to grab that Connect card that Thomas was telling you about earlier. There's a spot at the top where you can mark a box and indicate that you became a follower of Jesus. That will give us a chance to come alongside you and help you on this journey and pray for you as you get things rolling. You can also, again, access that at the springs.net slash connect card. Well, real quick before I let you go, I want to let you know something very exciting that we're going to do next week for Father's Day. Um, we, we have an opportunity to love our neighborhood well, and that's by doing something uh, called a food drive. Uh, we partner with an organization in town called Interfaith. Uh, Interfaith has uh, a reputation for feel, literally feeding our wider community, those who are in need. And um, because of the pandemic recently, their shelves are bare. And so what we want to do is we want to help restock those shelves and then some. Can we do that? So uh, next week, I want to challenge you to bring some non-perishable food items. There's a list on the coming up card in the welcome guide that you received today and also on the version notes if you'd rather find it there. Um, I want to encourage you to put that on the fridge, put it on the counter somewhere that you're going to see it. And remember to bring that stuff with you next week. Lastly, if you'd like to make a gift to the Springs today, thank you again for your generosity. It's been incredible in these last few months. And so if you'd like to make a gift to the Springs, if you go to the springs.net slash giving, there are some giving options there. And uh, if you have any questions about that, anyone on our staff team or volunteer squad uh, can help you out. So, hey, once again, thank you for being here today. Has it been a great weekend at the Springs? Amen. There you go. We'll see you guys back here for Father's Day next weekend. Same time, same place. God bless.